please welcome U.S. Navy Lieutenant Commander Kayla Barron. Hi, Hi everybody. Thanks so much for being here this week, uh, this evening. Uh, it's been an awesome week for me back in my hometown of Richland, Washington, and back in the Tri-Cities. And it's really humbling to see the turnout here tonight. Um, I took a little walk through the breakout rooms before coming in here. So I told them, even though they didn't make it into the main room, they got to talk to me first. So everybody sort of wins. You win some, you lose some. Um, my journey in a lot of ways started here in the Tri-Cities. I moved here the summer before my seventh grade year. I went to Chief Joseph Middle School and Richland High School. Some of my friends from high school are here tonight. My parents are here and still live in the Tri-Cities. And it's just so awesome to be home, not just on planet Earth, but back in my own hometown. Um, I'm really excited tonight to share a little bit about my latest adventure. Jim mentioned that I started my career in the Navy. I went to the Naval Academy and I served on submarines under the depths of the ocean. I was stationed on the USS Maine and that was home ported actually here in Washington State over on the west side and I got to deploy three times to the Pacific. And it was that experience of actually serving underneath the depths of the sea that inspired me to become an astronaut in the first place. When I was your guys' age, I didn't dream of becoming an astronaut. I thought I might want to serve in the military and eventually be a naval officer, but I didn't have the confidence to even imagine that until I had done something that was pretty similar. If you imagine the challenges it might take to live and work under the ocean and live and work in the vacuum of space, they're pretty much the same because you're sending people to live, work, and not only that, but accomplish a mission in a place where human beings aren't designed to hang out. And so it was those parallels that thought, made me think for the first time, maybe that's something I could do. And I had good mentors who encouraged me to put myself out there, apply and try. And sure enough, I was lucky enough to get selected to become a NASA astronaut. And that led me to my most recent adventure um, that I'm back fresh from, six months aboard the International Space Station. So I landed on May 6th, got my Earth legs back, as you can see, I'm walking okay again. Um, but I really wanted to share a little bit about what that might be like. Have you guys ever imagined what it might be like to live in outer space? You've thought about that before? There might be lots of aliens. Maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A. But, um, for me, you know, I didn't really allow myself to fully imagine that until I started working at NASA. I didn't fully understand the kind of team it took to do that kind of work, what astronauts do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I thought it would be fun to share a little bit about my adventure. I have about a 15-minute video um, that I want to share some of the things we do up there. And then I want to reserve the rest of the time to talk about what you guys are interested in talking about. So think about your questions. Nothing's off limits. I've been talking to school children all this week and I've heard everything. So if you guys can surprise me with a question I haven't heard yet, maybe we'll have to give you a special prize or something. Um, but here we go, let's roll the video. So the journey to space doesn't actually start on launch day. Uh, I was in training starting in 2017, but my crew got assigned together to train 24 months before launch. So a full two years, we were together as a crew. That's Raja, Tom, and Matthias. And we spent two years training every possible aspect of a space station mission. This is us at the SpaceX California facility where they built, built our capsule and trained us to fly it. So we spent a lot of time training there pre-launch. And then, then we also have a lot of facilities like this in Houston where we train emergency procedures for the International Space Station and a bunch of different other analog environments, trying to imagine what it would be like in microgravity. So here's a virtual reality system that allows us to practice spacewalking. Um, it's not our main facility for spacewalk training, but it allows us to learn how to handle masses and how our bodies might feel in outer space. We fly these really cool jets called the T-38s. It's an Air Force training jet converted for NASA use. And we think this is a really important part of our training because it puts us in a real world high consequence environment where we work as a team to communicate, make decisions and respond to a normal flight profile, but also potentially emergencies. This is my favorite kind of training, spacewalk training, in our underwater uh, facility called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. So we actually have a scale model of the space station where we practice spacewalk. I skills. was able to reach the TA clamps closest to the NCGL though, so those are released on my side. Copy. We also, like I mentioned, have to learn how to fly our capsule. So we practice training in our launch re-entry suits and all the nominal and emergency procedures we might need during those dynamic phases of flight. And that all leads us to the big day that a lot of people 
will imagine is a start to that journey, but we're already two years into our time together as a crew on this day, which is launch day. So right now we're in the Kennedy Space Flight Center historic suit up room. This is the same room where the Apollo astronauts and the shuttle astronauts don their suits before launch. And we're back at Kennedy Space Flight Center launching American astronauts from American soil as part of the commercial crew program. Here we walk out and we get a final chance to wave goodbye to our families from about six feet away because of COVID. Uh, if you fly SpaceX, you also get to ride in a Tesla to the launch pad. Nice little perk. You see here in a minute the full height of our Falcon 9 rocket with that tiny little dragon at the top. Here's Raja and Tom craning back in their suits to try to see all the way to the capsule from the base of the launch pad. And we access the capsule from the crew access arm. That's about 275 feet in the air, a hallway in the sky uh, that leads us over to our capsule. These awesome folks in the black here, we nickname them ninjas, but it's the SpaceX launch team. So they're there to get us strapped into the rocket safely and prepare us for launch. It's always interesting watching this with my mom in the room because I think she relives the re emotional experience of watching me la launch okay. for real. And uh, it's always funny to watch her face. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition and lift off. Copy, one out. I get goosebumps every time I watch that. My mom looks like she's recovering, her heart rate's going back down. I'm right here, mom. I made it. So you'll see here, see here, it takes a lot of thrust to get a rocket that big and a capsule that heavy to space. So right now you're seeing the first stage, en stage engine, which pushes us into orbit. On the bottom left, you see our velocity and altitude tapes. Yes, that does say 27,000 kilometers per hour. Dragon separation confirmed. Confirmed copy to you, Dragon, CE, welcome to orbit. So the first stage Hope engine separates because we need that really big Dragon, engine to push us to here. space, Space and then we have a smaller engine that helps us get the rest of the way to the space copy. station. And Kayla, give us five, 10 minutes. We'll try to get you an updated timeline now that we know our uh, final altitude on the Colliptic. Good evening, Europe. Guten Abend, Deutschland. This is uh, Endurance Crew Dragon 3. We're flying currently along Italy, heading towards Northern Europe. On the left side is Germany. We would like to show you this from the space view, but it's night and dark. But we just saw a few minutes ago how our final destination, oh, the International space, space Station, floating in space and shining like a diamond only 30 kilometers uh, forward of us. And that was such an emotional moment. We all felt very thrilled, very excited, and we can't wait to arrive there in a few hours. So we had hours. about 24 hours in orbit before finally approaching the space station. And this footage right here, it almost looks like CGI, but it's real. That's shot from a space station camera of our approach. The Dragon vehicle nominally auto automatically docks, so we actually don't have to fly it in. We have that capability if we need it, but in our case, we did a normal automatic docking and met our friends who are already there, like Mark Banda. Hi. And first through the hatch is going to be NASA astronaut Kayla Barron. Mark was six there. months into his historic 355-day mission when we arrived. Next he has the European record for the longest continuous Matthias American Mauer. space flight. And now we have NASA astronaut Tom Marshburn. He also has the important job of catching the rookies as they come through the hatch to make sure we don't float off too far. And NASA astronaut Raja Chari. So this is our crew together. Mark, Anton, and Piotr had already been up there for a while. Um, and we joined them and immediately got to work. 
Uh, the primary mission of the International Space Station is it's a laboratory. We do amazing scientific experiments up there in this really unique environment where we have microgravity and really unique laboratory equipment where we can do investigations that aren't possible on the ground. Um, so this is kind of a highlight reel of all the awesome science we get to do. Tom's using the deep freezer that we use to freeze biological samples here. Matias set up a new European Space Agency bioreactor. Raj and I participated in a few studies that were studying how the mind adapts to the spaceflight environment and perceives distances and objects in space. And we had some really cool plant experiments while we were up there, trying to understand how to better grow plants in microgravity so that someday crews might be able to grow their own food in orbit. We actually got to eat some of those hatched chilies during a taco night and sample them and give feedback to the scientists about what we thought. Raja here is showing our blood draw station. So in many cases, we are actually the experiment and we've donated every bodily fluid you can imagine to science. Uh, that's where we draw our blood. Um, and those are some really cool free-flying robots called Astrobees that we're trying to train to help us with routine tasks like cleaning or looking for lost objects, which we spend a lot of time doing in space. Here I'm setting up a CubeSat deployer, so each of those racks has four small satellites in it that will be deployed by Spring Force in space. This is one of our premier biological science facilities, it's the Life Sciences Love Box. And here, Raja is showing everybody's favorite place on the space station, the cupola window, which offers 360 degree views back at our home planet. Um, we have some amazing photographic equipment up there that allow us to take pictures in support of science targets and also uh, international disaster response targets. So if there's a major issue going on in the world, sometimes the disaster response folks on the ground ask if the astronauts are free to take pictures so that they can better plan the response using real-time imagery. This is Matias's least favorite experiment where I was measuring the pressure of his eye. I was lucky enough not to be a subject in this one. More really advanced biological experiment. Here, Tom is studying heart stem cells. That's when Raja had a mustache. Not scientific, but an important fact. Uh, the space station actually grew while we were up there as well. This uh, white bolt, uh, big ball module up there is called an OOM or node module. So the space station's still growing 20 plus years in. We also were lucky that we got to do a few spacewalks. A few weeks into our mission, I got to conduct my first spacewalk, and this is footage from that. Um, Tom Marshburn and I went out to replace a failed communications antenna. This antenna is one of our primary ways of talking to the ground, kind of like a giant space walkie-talkie, and we only have two of them, and one of them was broken. So we went outside to replace the failed one with a spare that we already had up on orbit. That's me right there. And that's Tom, he was riding the robotic arm, so he got these amazing views from like the maximum altitude you can get to on the space station. So we're also living up there for six months, so we have to stay healthy and maintain our bodies. So this, this is footage from our gym. This is where we lift weights, which most of us do six or seven times a week. Um, and then we also have cardio equipment like this treadmill, which is on the wall actually, but I have bungees pulling my feet down. There's also no barber or hairstylist up there, so we have to cut each other's hair. Raja usually cut Matias' hair, and I usually cut Raja's hair, so if you want to critique who is better, you can look up pictures later. And once a week, we all got together for a family dinner. Every Friday, the entire crew came together for a family-style meal. Looks like we might be having a taco night here. You saw, saw snack sharing earlier, that's drink sharing. Don't worry, we all tested negative for COVID before we launched. We had a lot of visitors while we were up here, up there. Those are two private citizens from Japan who came up as part of a Russian spaceflight participant mission. We were up there for the holidays. Those are my Christmas presents for my crewmates. I thought my wrap job wasn't bad given that I didn't have any real supplies. Uh, we had a cookie decorating contest that uh, took advantage of microgravity, so some 3D z designs there. This is us just hanging out, Raja apparently on the ceiling because there's not enough room. 
Uh, this is a time lapse I shot of a Russian spacewalk where they're outfitting that new module that came up. They're running some cables, and I really like this because they kind of look like little cockroaches out there crawling all over the station. Um, this is a cargo vehicle that visited us, and this one is always really cool because we actually get to capture it with the robotic arm. So it comes and flies near the station, and Raja and I actually flew the arm out to grab it, and then the arm drives it over and plugs it into the space station so we can open it up and get our supplies. This is when I won the contest for biggest water bubble. Proud day. I think Matias here is trying to see how many times he can flip without hitting his head. And here we're demonstrating feats of strength. Tom's doing a push-up with three of his friends on his back, and Mark Van de Hei can squat the whole crew. This is some sort of a new space sport where I think I was the ball. I'm not really sure what the rules were. But all that fun leads up to more work. Towards the end of our mission, we had a really busy run of things go on. First, we had a, my second spacewalk, Raja's first. Uh, this time, we went out to build a big support structure for a new solar array that'll be installed hopefully later this year or early next year. It was kind of like a giant erector set. Some of the struts were nine feet long, and the bag containing all of them weighed 750 pounds. Um, so I'm pretty strong. I dragged it all the way out there. We had the new Soyuz crew arrive, so three new cosmonaut colleagues arrived to replace Mark Van de Hei's crew. And I think the very next day, Raja and Matias did a spacewalk, so we were pretty busy up there. Um, they had it, headed out to do what we were calling, kind of calling Franken EVA, because it was like a bunch of tasks. They were kind of jungle gymming all over the International Space Station doing a bunch of upgrades. This was a tough day, saying goodbye to our friends who we'd spent probably four and a half months with in space. And as soon as they left, the first private astronaut mission in the history of the International Space Station arrived, the Axiom-1 crew. So we hosted them for a planned eight days, but they were actually there for 15. Um, so we had house guests for a little bit longer than we expected. And once they left and freed up the docking port, Crew-4 finally arrived. So these are our NASA friends who came to replace us, um, one big happy family. It was fun hosting them up there, but pretty bittersweet because it meant that it was time for us to go home. <laughs> This is us attempting a flyby sequence in our SpaceX suits. As you can see, we didn't do so hot. This was actually the best take, believe it or not. We'll try again next time. But we were back in those suits because it was time to head home. So like I said, for us, pretty bittersweet. I, I call us the happiest crew in the history of the space station because we had a fantastic time up there. It was super fulfilling and we got a lot of incredible work done, but it was time to head home to our families. Um, you guys saw at the beginning of the video how much thrust it took to get that capsule into space. Now gravity is working in our favor on the way open. home. All we have to do is fall in a controlled fashion and splash down in the ocean. So it's a little bit different, but the rocket science is just as hard. We were lucky actually on our way up and down that we got 24 hours in our capsule. Sometimes the flight is short, as short as four to six hours. Uh, some crews might not like that, but we actually really enjoyed it because we had 24 hours of no work assigned where we could just look out the window together. Here you can see parts of the heat shield sublimating off as it heats up when we go through the atmosphere, which is normal, not to worry. Copy, we see the same. Descent rate nominal. So the parachutes slow us down so that when we hit the water, we're at a safe speed of land. Yeah, that reefing action that you just mentioned uh, playing out right in front of us. And Raja, we see the same. It's a Once beautiful again. sight to see those shoots inflate through the camera and then All right, as you can see there on your screen. <laughs> Dragon Endurance. So the footage here looks black and white. They're using a special infrared camera to see us because it was actually dark and at night.
but when we get closer to the boat, so you'll see that pristine white capsule you remember from the earlier footage looks a little bit more like a toasted marshmallow. It's been an absolute honor to support also you on your normal, mission. Mom. Endurance crew, and thanks for flying SpaceX. Thanks, sir. We're glad to be back. Thanks for letting us take uh, Endurance on a shakedown cruise. Looking forward to watching many more flights of Endurance in the future. That was a, a great ride uh, and enjoyed working with the NASA and SpaceX team. So, so we were really we're excited and grateful to be home safely. And I think for all of us, we took a piece of the space station and that experience with us. Uh, there's something really special about seeing the Earth from the privileged perspective we had in orbit. Um, I know for me, it really gave me the sense of humility, seeing our beautiful planet in this way, seeing the thin layer of the Earth's atmosphere. That's the only thing that separates us from outer space. And I know for me, it really drove home the fact that I'm a steward of this planet for a tiny blip in time and made me even more thoughtful about my role and what I wanted to do to turn a better planet over to the next generation, which is awesome that we have some of them here tonight. So thank you so much for your attention and hearing a little bit about some of the things I've been up to in the past year. I'm really excited to take your questions. The plan for that is um, the audience, we don't have an extra mic for questions and the breakout rooms aren't gonna be able to hear people. So I think what we'll do is if you raise your hand, I'll call on you and then I'm gonna repeat the question so that the, the, the other rooms hopefully can hear it. So let's start with a few of the kids in the front and then maybe go to some of the adults in the back. How about right here in the pink shirt? The question is, why was my hair so curly in space? So you're right, my hair is straight down here. It doesn't look nearly as cool, right? At least I don't think so. My hair is straight here. It has a, maybe a little tiny bit of a wave, but there's something about being in microgravity. I don't know, there was these commercials growing up for hair products that said, get weightless, bouncy curls. And I guess that's just what I had up there. Um, I asked my hairstylist about this. My hairstylist is really cool. He actually trained Raja and Tom how to cut my hair in space. So he gave them this special class trying to imagine what it would be like to cut hair up there because really we're just freestyling it. That's why the haircuts look so bad on some of the guys. Um, but we didn't end up cutting my hair because it was curly and it was awesome. And so my whole life I've been waiting for a good hair day and I got six months straight while I was up there. I don't know why it was curly. My hairstylist kind of explained that everybody has different hair shapes and maybe like the cross section of my hair is a little bit oval, less than a perfect circle. And so up there when gravity wasn't pulling it down, it was able to curl. I don't know. I wish it looked like that all the time. And I asked him if he could make my hair like that on earth and he said, no way. So <laughs> I'm stuck with this hairdo. How about back here in the white shirt? How did I eat? Well, we have a lot of food up there on the space station, and it's actually, we have a couple different kinds of food. My parents and I were talking about this this morning, actually, because my dad joked that nobody cares what my favorite food in space was, and so maybe I shouldn't talk about that, but my mom says maybe they do care, and so we started talking about breakfast, and it was kind of interesting because it told my parents a little bit more about the different kinds of food we have up there. So my favorite thing for breakfast was vegetable quiche with sausage links on the side. And my dad said, don't you like sausage patties better? And I said, not in space, because the sausage links are something we call thermostabilized. So this special kind of way of preserving food, and it's the same way the military preserves food. So any veterans in the house who's ever had an MRE or meals ready to eat, it's the exact same kind of food, they also send it to space. About half our food is like that, and the other half NASA makes special for us, including the sausage patties. Those are dehydrated and you have to add water back in and then put them in, a, in the oven and they soak the water back up and then you eat them. And so I kind of like the thermostabilized food better, especially for meat products, because it's hard to get the meat texture just right with the right amount of water. And so we have lots of different kinds of food, but it's a condensed standard menu is what we call it, which means there aren't that many choices. You can't just go to the store and get whatever you want or order stuff on DoorDash or Uber Eats like you all have been doing during COVID. So you just have a few options, but the food is actually really good and you just make it in a little oven that's hot and it heats the food up and then you eat it with a spoon. But the first time I ate it was pretty weird because the food doesn't fall onto your tongue. So you kind of have to get used to that sensation, but it only took a couple of days. Any adults want to ask a question back here? How about in the blue shirt? 
That's a complex question. That's more like a dinner party question. Okay, so the question is, if I had the chance to go to Mars, would I go, what would I take with me, and what do I think would be the most challenging about that experience, more or less? We'll see how we do on that. Okay, so um, NASA is hoping that the work we do as part of the Artemis mission, learning to live and work on the surface of the moon, will help enable us to make it to Mars in the late 2030s. Think about that. That'll be, maybe these guys will be going to Mars. Maybe I'll still be an active astronaut. That would be probably my plan. Um, but the trip to Mars using technology we expect to be available will take two to three years because of the propulsion technology that we think we'll have. And you have to wait for ideal planetary alignment the shortest distance to make it there. Um, but that's still a really long trip, <laughs> two to three years away from home. Um, so I think some of the biggest technological challenges we'll face in making that happen are just how to keep human beings healthy for that long. Because the spaceflight environment is tough on your body. It's a radiation environment, and being in microgravity has a lot of different effects on your bones, on your muscles, your eyes, a lot of different things that we're trying to develop countermeasures for to keep the crew healthy. But then once you get there, you have to land on the surface of another planetary body, generate power, have food, all of these different things. And so it's a pretty complex mission, and when we do it for the first time, we're gonna be testing a lot of technology for the first time. And that's actually why we wanna use the moon as a proving ground for these missions, because it's a lot closer to the home. The moon is actually super far away. It's 250,000 miles away from Earth. On the space station, I was only 250 miles above the surface. So to me, that sounds really far, but it's only a three-day ride compared to that two to three-year mission. Um, so I'm not really sure I've thought about wh exactly what I would take with me. I can tell you what I took to the space station. Um, we get about a shoebox full of personal items that we're allowed to take with us to space. And the most important thing that I took was pictures of my family and friends. Um, that was really important to me to stay connected. I did that same thing on my submarine deployment. It's nice to take the people who love you the most with you on journeys like this to remind you why you're doing it and why it matters. How about another one from the kids? Yeah, that's a good question. So our guy in the front who NASA should hire today, who knows a lot of facts about space. So when we're orbiting around the Earth, we go 17,500 miles an hour. And that's a good speed for us to stay in orbit because we're actually free falling around the planet. Because we're not, people like to say there's no gravity in space. That's not true. Gravity, the Earth's gravity is acting on us the whole time because it's helping keep us in that circle. Without gravity, we would just fly straight off because we're traveling so fast. So the speed we're traveling at helps counteract that pull of gravity. And the gravity of the Earth actually pulls us back closer to the Earth over time. So we have to fire engines to boost our altitude back up. So over time, we sink down a little bit and then we fly back higher. So that's why we have to go so fast is to stay in orbit around the planet. What was the other part of your question? I think I forgot. Oh, that's a tough one. The question is about when I operated on a submarine. I can't tell you exactly how far beneath the surface of the ocean I went, unfortunately. But we did hang out down there for three months at a time. And one time I was under the surface of the water without surfacing for a whole month. It's crazy. No windows like we have in space either. All right, Shark Man, do we have our question? Okay, so the question is, why don't we launch straight off the planet and just keep going in a straight line? Why do we go in a circle? Yeah, because then you could go outside the galaxy. I see what you mean. Um, yeah, that's actually a real good idea, and I think we'll do something closer to that when we go to other planets or planetary bodies like the moon. So our goal when we go to the space station is to orbit around the Earth in a circle. So we actually circle the Earth 16 times a day, every 90 minutes. And that's an area that we like to call low Earth orbit. That's the orbit we're around the Earth. Now the Apollo astronauts, they went all the way to the moon, which I said is a lot further away, 250,000 miles. But you don't really travel in a straight line in space very often because everything is moving. The Earth is orbiting around the sun, and the moon is orbiting around the Earth, and so is Mars. Mars is orbiting around the sun as well. So if you want to go to these places, you have to use really complex mathematical equations to figure out the best way to get there. And it's kind of like when you, have you ever flown in the plane and you see the maps on the screen showing how the plane flies? They don't normally fly in a straight line either, do they? They kind of fly in a curve, right? That's because the Earth is curved, so the shortest distance actually isn't a perfectly straight line the way you see it on a map. So it's similar to that. How about another, maybe pink shirt with the hat back there? Yeah. 
So the question is, how do we drink water in space? Um, we saw a few of those in the video, but we actually drink our, all of our liquids out of pouches with straws. And the straws have a special clip so that you can close the straw because water behaves in this really unique way in space. You saw that big ball of water I was able to have floating in front of me. Water likes to crawl and move in this really kind of almost lifelike way in space. And so we have to keep it contained unless we're ready to drink it. So we have the, our water, tea, coffee, whatever you can imagine, in a pouch with a straw. And we open up the clip when the straw's already in our mouth, take your drink, and then you close the clip before you take it out of your mouth. Um, but yeah, there's always water getting flicked around out of the ends of the straws. And if you accidentally leave it open, you make a pretty big mess and have to clean it up. But other than that, it's pretty normal. Let's see, how about, oh, I, I remember you from RHS. How about you back there? This is a Naval Academy aspiring student, so close to my heart. Yeah, so the question is um, from a Girl Scout in the audience who's a senior at Richland High. Um, was there anything from my childhood that helped prepare me for the things that I went on to do later in life? And the answer is absolutely. And I think Girl Scouts is a good example. You'll notice that up there I had a pretty big team. And that, that crew was actually just a small representative of the larger team that helps support us on the ground. There are hundreds if not thousands of people at every single moment supporting space station operations and science experiments. So if you wanna do stuff like that, you gotta know how to work on a team. And so I think growing up that was a really big part of my development, whether it was things like Girl Scouts or sports, I ran cross country and track, working in my community in different ways. I was on the Parks and Recreation Commission for the city of Richland as a kid. I was part of the city government team. So I was really engaged in learning how do you communicate and solve complex problems together, and how can you use the people around you as a force multiplier for your own strengths? Because we all need people to support us. We all have strengths and weaknesses, and we can't do anything alone. And so I always like a strong team beside me, especially because I like to do hard things. I like to pursue challenges, and I know that means that I'm going to make mistakes, and that's the best way to learn. But I'm going to learn best if I have an amazing team beside me to help me do better the next time. Pick me up when I fall, dust me off, and say, go get them again, but do this better next time. And so I had that. Growing up, I had that in the Navy and at the Naval Academy, and I definitely have that at NASA. All right, how about right here in the front? So the question is, how many Gs do we experience during these dynamic phases of flight? Um, so on the way up and the way down, it's the peak G is about four and a half. Um, and the way we experience that is a little bit different. The most dramatic transition is actually when those chutes deploy, like you saw at the end of the window there. Because as we're falling, we're accelerating. And that acceleration slowly increases to about four and a half Gs. And then the chutes deploy, and our acceleration drops dramatically. So that feels even worse than the slow uh, buildup of the acceleration. But the capsule's designed so that all of that G, that G force that makes us feel heavy kind of hits us in the chest, straight in the front. Um, unlike when you fly in those high performance jets like you saw earlier in the video, a lot of times the maneuvers we do there makes the blood rush from our head to our feet. And that's why people wear G suits or do special maneuvers to try to keep blood in their head so they don't pass out. In the vehicle, we don't really have that problem. Your chest just feels heavy and it's kind of hard to breathe. And then some people get motion sickness from those dramatic changes in acceleration. How about in the black NASA shirt? Yeah, so when we we're growing the plants that you saw in the video, did we have to do anything to make them grow better? Um, the answer is yes. Scientists are trying to understand what's different about plants growing in microgravity. And there's some interesting challenges. We talk about how do humans drink water in space. We have to figure out how to water plants in space. And that's a big challenge. And that was one of the experiments we were doing where you saw me helping water the plants. We were testing a new way to water plants in space. But there's some interesting things scientists have learned. They originally hypothesized, what if plants would grow in every direction without gravity? They don't know where to go. But they found that, maybe unsurprisingly, but we have to prove it, that they grow towards their light source. So they still grow in one direction, which is helpful if you're trying to grow an orderly, efficient garden. Um, but yeah, the scientists are trying to tweak a bunch of things, including the genome of the plants, so that they'll grow more efficiently in space. How about in the very back, in the blue shirt? 
Yeah, so the question is, we showed some stuff in the video of how we, what we do for our physical health, including working out. What do we do for our mental health? Um, that's an excellent question. I think NASA has a really good culture around supporting astronauts in these extreme environments. It's a pretty weird experiment, experience to be actually off the planet um, and away from your family and friends for that long. And so we have an awesome support team on the ground that supports us not only while we're in flight, but the day we start at NASA, we have behavioral health specialists that embed with us on our teams. They're operational psychologists mostly. They come with, an, uh, with us on our field training and help us learn how to conduct effective debriefs, how to manage conflict effectively, how to manage our own internal processes so that we are emotionally healthy throughout that experience. And I think for me, the biggest support for my mental health while I was up there was my actual crew. So our crew was really, really close. One of the reasons I think we were the happiest crew in the history of the space station is we were really good friends. We were a family up there. And so when we needed to support, we turned first to the only other people in the world or off the world who could really understand what we were going through that day, and that was our crewmates. And so we helped each other through the hardest moments and also relied on our support network back on the ground, which luckily, because of technological advancements, we actually could call people from space. We have two-way audio video chats once a week, um, and, so we, and we have email. So we have a lot of ways to communicate with our family and friends and our support network in real time. Um, and we're also really careful about sleep hygiene, getting enough sleep, especially before critical operations. And that those workouts that are part of our physical health were actually a huge part of our mental health as well. I don't know if you guys felt that way, especially being cooped up during the pandemic. Like being in your house is not that different than <laughs> being stuck in the space station. But for us, working out really made us feel better mentally and physically each day. How about another one from the kiddos? How about right here in the tank top? Have I ever had a rip in my spacesuit? No, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, so the space, that's a really good question. So the spacesuits that we wear in the capsule are also designed to protect us in the event that there's a depressurization and they have to keep us with breathable air, keep us alive if that were to happen. So that's why we wear those suits. We don't actually need them if everything goes normally. But when we go outside, we definitely need that spacesuit. So the, the ones you saw in the spacewalk, they're pressurized to 4.3 pounds differential pressure and that's the actual pressure they'll be at when we're in a vacuum. And that provides air for us to breathe. But if you got a hole in your spacesuit, you would lose that breathable air. And so we're actually, desi they're designed to withstand that. So if we do get a small hole in our spacesuit, we're able to make up for that with the oxygen we have in the suit. And there's extra backup oxygen and special emergency procedures that we would use to get the person who has a hole in their spacesuit back to the airlock as quickly as possible so that we can get people inside. So nobody's ever gotten a hole in their spacesuit. I don't know if you guys, have you guys seen The Martian where he like flies himself with a cut in his finger or something? I don't know that, that I wouldn't try that. <laughs> it looked really hard. It'd be very hard to control yourself, but it was cool for the movie. But we've never had anything like that, luckily, because we take really good care of our spacesuits. We inspect them carefully. And we're also really careful when we're outside because the space station, when it went up, it was perfectly pristine and they're very careful about sharp edges. But micrometeorites have been hitting the space station for 20 plus years now. So there's a lot of weird nicks and cuts, but we keep track of where those are and they tell us not to touch them. And so we're just really careful to try to prevent that. How about right here in the black? So the question is, how do I feel about the move towards the commercialization space? It is an amazing time in human space flight. The commercialization of low Earth orbit is happening and it's happening fast. And me personally, as an astronaut and NASA as a whole, we view that as a super symbiotic relationship. We want commercial companies to come work in low Earth orbit so that we can focus on exploration. We want to return to the moon and push onto Mars, and those are not things that's going to make anybody money anytime soon. We're going to invest those dollars because we want to pave the way for scientific investigation and inspiring the next generation, and we're ready to turn low Earth orbit over to those companies. So the companies we're partnering with as part of the commercial crew program and the other companies that are trying to find a market for going to low Earth orbit, we think that's fantastic. We think that's great because we've learned a ton from operating the International Space Station. It's a super mature vehicle, super mature operational concept, and we're ready to apply what we've learned there in new environments. So we think it's awesome and we're encouraging that. Um, so yeah, it's great. It's great for everybody. I hope more people can have this amazing experience by going to space. So yeah, the, the more the better. Um, how about in the back row in the green shirt? 
Okay, the question was, there's been lots of launches, uncrewed launches in the past years, test flights, that's what Artemis 1 will be like. What was my feeling at takeoff? Um, so for the most part, we were really focused. We had a, actually the longest launch delay since the 90s or something like that. So by the time we finally got to the launch pad, we were really, really ready to go. And I think my family was ready for me to get off the planet too, because it was pretty stressful. Um, but we really just relied on our training. We were following our checklist, monitoring systems and procedures. But that being said, in the terminal countdown that you saw there at the video, the traditional 10, 9, 8, you get all the way down to one and zero. And there's kind of this magic moment as the engines light beneath you. You hear the sound, you feel the rumble, and then the rocket j lifts just off the pad. And in my memory of it, it felt like it hung there for just a split second. So we were off the ground, but not quite launching yet. And that was the moment where I felt for sure I was finally going to space. And in that moment, I had this rush of the purest emotion I've ever felt in my life of joy and excitement. I cried a couple of tears of joy that my crewmates kind of teased me about later. Um, and then I just got straight back to work because we have a lot to monitor during that dynamic phase of flight. But it was a beautiful ride. Um, I think once we got there, we we're kind of like, whoa, that was it. Like, it was smooth. It was exactly what we were expecting from our training. We knew what it should sound like, what it should feel like, what the systems should look like along the way. The launch team performed phenomenally. Um, so we just kind of got up there. And you could have almost, like, tricked us, like, just kidding, you're in the simulator in Hawthorne. And that was just a practice run because it felt so, we felt so prepared for that moment. How about in the white shirt? So the question is, were there any hoops I had to jump through as a female astronaut from another one of our Girl Scouts in the astronauts, or in the, in the um, audience? You know, no. Um, I think, so our astronaut corps has had women in it for decades. Uh, women have been doing first in the space program since the shuttle era, even before that with the Russian Space Agency. And we're a really diverse, integrated office. That kind of, the astronaut office, as you think of, in the Apollo era, Mercury, Gemini, we look like America now. We look like a cross-section of America, and that includes women, people of color, all walks of life. Um, and we get the same power behind that as our country gets from different perspectives, different experiences. And we think that's really important for the complex problems we're trying to solve. And that's why we have these international partnerships as well, because different countries also bring a different perspective and set of skills. That's why when we're going back to the moon, it's not just going to be Americans this time. We're going with our international partners. And so we re really see the power in letting everyone bring the best version of themselves and the full version of themselves to the team and the challenge. And we know that every single day, that means we operate as a stronger team. How about in the back? Yes, yeah, so the question was, did everything go well while we were up there, or did we face any emergencies or off, off nominal situations, and how did we respond? Um, yeah, I would say one of the, I mean, we always face off nominal things. Nothing ever goes according to plan in space, whether it's like the big thing, like a spacewalk, or the tiniest thing, like trying to put a, hundred screws into a piece of equipment. You lose one, they're the wrong size, you don't have the right tool. So we're always working through different problems and that's always we're always relying on the team. I would say the closest thing we had to like an off nominal or contingency situation while we were up there was a few days after we arrived, um, Russia conducted an anti-satellite missile test that broke up a satellite into a giant debris cloud. Now normally, the Space Force and Air Force help us monitor all debris over a certain size in space and they give us a warning if that there is a chance that it will be anywhere near the space station so that we can actually move out of the way before we get there and draw that probability down to basically zero. Um, but in this case, there was a brand new debris cloud with hundreds of thousands of new pieces of debris that meet the size requirements that they didn't know exactly where they were, how they were moving, but we, they knew that our path would likely go through some of it. And so we actually sheltered in place in our vehicle, which is the start of an evacuation procedure on our, I think, second or third day in space. Um, and for us, actually, you know, we weren't scared in that moment. We were really impressed by the mission control teams in Houston and Moscow. They communicated really clearly. They made really conservative decisions, and the whole team was on the same page. Um, we relied on our training. These are procedures we practiced before flight, so we got it done. And I think the only thing that was really tough about it was when we got in our capsule and closed the hatch, we were like, oh, no, are we going home? <laughs> 
we just got here. So that was the really hard thing for us emotionally. It was just considering for that brief moment, like, man, we worked for years, our whole lives for this experience, and we're about to leave. Um, but luckily, it wasn't that serious. Um, once the team was able to wrap their heads around the challenge, they decided it was safe for us to come back into the space station. Um, but it was actually, in hindsight, when we went back and debriefed it as a crew, we talked about that a little bit earlier, learning from situations like this, how what you can do better next time. It was pretty cool for us because we didn't get to train closely with the Soyuz crew we were joining. We're a crew of seven on the space station, not just the four in the capsule. And so it was a chance for us to execute a real emergency procedure together um, and learn about how we can best communicate, what habits we want to have, what standards we want to have as a crew. And for us, it really just built trust and confidence in each other and the ground team. How about another one from the front? How about my astronaut right here, my shuttle commander? I'll sign it after the show. Yes, I will sign your paper. And um, what was my favorite thing about being in space? Um, I have a couple of things. I would say the favorite part of like my official job was I loved doing my spacewalks. Spacewalks, in addition to being really cool, are a fun team challenge. And I'm really drawn to that, like I've mentioned. I really like working with other people to do really hard things. And the fun thing about a spacewalk is that it's a physical challenge. It's really hard to work in that suit, especially for six plus hours. And we're in that suit for 10 plus hours just to get ready to go out the door before and then come back in and get out. So it, it's a really physical challenge. You don't have food in the suit, which is bad for me. My family, Carly, could agree that I'm a hangry person. I'm not like a bad person when I'm hungry, so I have to overcome my hanger uh, during spacewalks. But it's also really technically demanding work. We're doing really detailed manual tasks that whole time and communicating about really technical hard problems and nothing goes according to plan. And so getting through that moment, it's kind of like running two marathons back to back without food, very little water while trying to solve a Rubik's Cube and do push-ups at the same time or something. It's just like this really weird experience, but for me, it was a really fun challenge because it meant the team had to work at its best together in order to get the mission done that day. We're operating with limited time, limited consumables, and we have to go out and do really important work to keep the station running. And so for me, those were the days I learned the most and also had the most fun. How about right here? The question is, what was my favorite part about being on the space station and did I ever meet Elon Musk? I'll answer the second one first because the short answer, no, I've never met Elon Musk. Um, and what was my favorite part about being on the space station? You know, I think it was just the experience of living with this crew. Um, it was a really special collection of people and everybody was really dedicated to being their authentic selves and encouraging others to do so, supporting each other, and we really got through every single day as a giant challenge. We're usually working independently, just in parallel on different tasks, but we really t treated each day as a team challenge. The, we weren't done as individuals until the crew was done, and we got really close. We were like a family up there. We had a lot of fun, too. I wish I could show you all the footage of us goofing around. You swing dancing, inventing cool flips, having a movie nights once a week, all this fun stuff. So it's actually really fun to to be up there too, even though we're working really hard. How about my future NASA employee? Oh boy, man. What do you want to be when you grow up, buddy? Just curious. Okay, we got an engineer to astronaut here, which is asking me very detailed questions <laughs> about the rocket engines that I honestly don't know the answer to. That's a thing you got to do when you're an astronaut too, is admit when you don't know something. So I'm not an expert in our engine systems, but I can tell you, like I said, it was a pretty smooth ride. Highly recommend the Falcon 9. <laughs> it's not an official endorsement. <laughs> um, how about in the striped shirt? Can phones work in space? Um, you know, none of us brought our phones with us to space because we left them on Earth with our families because they wouldn't work very well up there. But we do have internet. Um, so we actually do use tablets and a lot of other electronic resources, laptop computers that are connected to the internet because it's the best way for us to communicate. And we use all electronic procedures. Um, and that's how we get our schedule each day. So yeah, we do have computers and electronics, and we do have access to the internet. How about in the blue lace shirt there? Blue and gray. <laughs> so the question is, what advice would I give to kids, maybe even the kids here tonight, to accomplish great things? Um, 
I've been reflecting on that a lot this week because it's been kind of interesting to be back in my hometown where I went to school and grew up and made a lot of the decisions that set me on my path. Um, and I would say I, I had some direction as a kid. I grew up with a sister who knew she was going to be a doctor and has become one. She knew from like, I think, age three or something she was going to be a doctor someday, and she is. I, when I was r probably a lot of these kids' age, I wanted to be a novelist. I was going to write fiction. Um, and then I wanted to be a lawyer. And then I wanted to be an Air Force lawyer. Bad choices. <laughs> I really reformed myself in time before it was too late. Um, and then I decided I want to be a Navy fighter pilot. Um, a big part of those decisions, I have a lot of um, extended family in the military, but my dad actually opened up my eyes to the idea of going to a service academy when I was about 12 years old. Um, and then in the fall of my eighth grade year, September 11th happened. And for me, that kind of felt like the end of my childhood in a lot of ways. I think watching that happen live on TV really opened my eyes to how complex our world is. And for me, really made me sure that I wanted to serve, that I wanted to commit myself to something larger than myself and make my life really matter, and that I wanted to be around people who are like-minded. And so I wanted to surround myself with people like that, and that's how I ended up following these paths. But the questions I asked myself at that age were really important because I wasn't sure exactly what that path would look like. And when I was clarifying that thinking that set me on those first steps, I asked myself questions like, what am I passionate about? I worshiped my big sister and had this, you know, inferiority complex of the middle child, all of these things. Um, and I really had to start asking myself, what do I care about? What am I passionate about? Because I want to put my energies behind that. Not trying to be as good as my big sister at stuff or impress my parents or teachers or whatever. What lights me up? What makes me happy? And then the second question I asked myself was, what's the hardest thing I can do? Because I knew that if I wanted to accomplish great things and contribute to amazing teams, that I had to become a better person, a better teammate, better follower, better leader. I needed more skills, more knowledge, more, knowledge, more self-knowledge. And so to do that, I was going to have to do hard things. And so then the final question, maybe the most important one, is who do I want standing next to me when things are hard? This is an important thing for kids to think about, too. Who who do you surround yourself with? Who are your friends? Who are your teachers, coaches, mentors? Who do you go to for advice? Who do you go ask when things are tough? Because those are the people who are going to help you turn those challenges into opportunities to grow. And so those guiding questions led me to the Naval Academy, led me to the submarine force, and ultimately led me to NASA. And I was lucky along the way that I had amazing mentors in my life who encouraged me in those moments of doubt. Could I really become an astronaut? Did I have any business even applying? I had people in my life who said, yes, of course you do. Put yourself out there. You might not get selected, but you should try. And so that was really impactful for me. And I think when I was able to clarify those questions and brave enough to share my dreams with others so they could support me, I knew that I could find my path. Thanks. How about in the Gap sweatshirt down here? Okay, so the questions are, space is a different environment. What are some unique thoughts I had? What's our day-to-day -day life like? And what were my favorite experiments? Um, so I had a lot of unique thoughts up there. It's a really amazing perspective. Those views that we saw at the end of the video are the things that we see when we look out the window. It's incredible to see that in real time. A lot of people go to snap photos of those things. Usually I just called my crewmates and said, let's not take pictures, let's just watch, especially for Aurora and stuff like that. Um, because those, exper those experiences were really impactful for us to see the Earth from that perspective and know that we want to protect and contribute to our planet. Um, so I think for me, it really drove home that responsibility to take care of the Earth. Um, our day-to-day -day schedule we start at 7.30 in the morning with our official work day, which means that most of us get up at about 6, especially if breakfast is important to us. So that's not true of all my crewmates, but I got up <laughs> at about 6 every day. Yeah. Um, so the time zone, yeah. We actually work on Greenwich Mean Time, which is the time zone in England, also known as Zulu time to any military nerds in the audience. 
Um, but we, so we work on that time zone because it kind of splits the difference between our major control centers. So all the other control centers around the world, they're in 24 hour shift work. The whole crew, our crew slept at the same time and had the same work day, but the ground teams are on the clock 24 hours a day. They're manning the mission control center so that they can support us. So we start at 7.30 in the morning with a big conference where all those control centers all around the world, we talk about the plan for the day, ask any final questions and then get straight to work. And our day actually wraps up at 7.30 p.m. where we have our evening planning conference. So it's a 12-hour 12 12 work day, uh, but we do get time to work out, thankfully. We get to go to the gym during work. That's a pretty sweet perk. Um, and we also get a break for lunch, just like you guys do at school. And we do that Monday through Friday. Usually we try to take the weekends off, but we have to do chores on the weekend probably like you guys do. We have to clean the space station every Saturday. We have a, basically a chore wheel. We rotate around different jobs and we clean up. Um, and my favorite experiment while I was up there, I really like the technology demonstrations that will enable new experiments. So one thing that I thought was really cool, and so did my friend Matthias, is we actually got this special kind of uh, microscope called a scanning electron microscope. And it allows you to take pictures of really, really tiny things. Um, and Matthias is a material scientist, so he really lo loved that. And I thought it was cool, because I worked with one of these things in my research at the Naval Academy. And the microscope I used was like, huge you know it's like the size of a giant desk or a cubicle and this little guy was just miniaturized super tiny and so small enough that we could send something like that to space this amazing imaging technology and Matthias and I thought it was really cool because we actually imaged a Martian asteroid that had flown to earth and we sent back to space <laughs> to take pictures of it just because it's cool but also to demonstrate that we could use technology like that on the lunar surface or eventually the Martian surface so that the scientists back home can look at these really detailed pictures and tell us what are the most interesting rock samples to bring home. How about, let's see, guy with the sunglasses on his head and the polo shirt. Yeah, so the question is, what did I find tougher in my experience on a submarine or in the space program, and was I a nuke? So nuke is a term that refers to sailors in the Navy who study nuclear power, either on submarines or on surface ships. And yes, I was a nuke. Um, I have my gold dolphins here on my jacket because I'm very proud of that. Um, and so I, I served in the submarine force as a naval officer. All naval officers in the submarine force do both things. They learn nuclear power and work in the engine room and also do ship operations as officer of the deck driving the boat, essentially. Um, and so which was harder? Um, that's a tough question, but I would say in a lot of ways my service on the submarine was harder. It was my first job out of college, my first job as a young leader. And one thing that's really incredible about the Navy is the kind of responsibility they'll give to you as a 24-year-old just blows your mind. Um, I think for me, when I first got to my submarine, I was super intimidated by that operational world. I was a really nerdy student. I loved school. I went to grad school because I loved school so much before continuing on in my Navy training. And I was really comfortable studying books. Not so comfortable in the hot seat because I liked having the right answer. And in operations, on a submarine in space, there's rarely one right answer because you have to make decisions in real time and the situation's constantly changing. So you're looking for a good enough answer, not the perfect answer. But I was used to trying to find the perfect answer to put in a box at the bottom of my test and get full credit if I could, right? So that was the world I was used to living in. And actually, if you guys will humor me, we actually still have some time. So I'm actually gonna take some time to tell a story about my time during that um, on the submarine that I think illustrates why it was so developmental and challenging for me. Um, so when we get to a submarine, our qualifications are self-paced. You show up, you get put in charge of a division, which is a portion of the ship, but you also have to learn how to stand watch. That's the whole point. We have to take a submarine underway and operate in the ocean. And at any given moment on a submarine deployed, a third of the crew is actively standing watch to keep that thing moving through the water and accomplishing its mission. We have sailors taking logs on analog gauges. We have an officer of the deck who's making the call on behalf of the captain for what the ship is doing and kind of running the whole show. But the first thing you do as an officer is you get qualified to stand engineering officer of the watch, which those of us who in the room who work out at Hanford can probably relate to this. Um, maybe you did some of your training in the Navy, but that's the person who oversees the nuclear reactor plant and the entire engine room, all the sailors who are working there. 
And I studied nuclear engineering in grad school. I thought nuclear power was really important and really cool. But imagining making calls about a nuclear reactor, making decisions in real time, potentially when emergency were, were happening, was pretty intimidating to me. So I got straight to work. I was going to learn everything I could about that reactor plant before the first time I stood engineering office to watch. I was reading technical manuals nobody knew existed. And for me, that meant that I, I felt like that's what I needed to know to be in charge, but it was slowing me down. And so one night, super late, I think it must have been midnight or something, I'm in this tiny room called Office or Study with a million technical manuals, all these diagrams of the electrical system out, and my captain walked in and asked me what I was working on. And I said, I'm working on studying the turbine generator system. And he said, why are you, why are you studying all these books? I don't think I've ever looked at that techni technical manual. This is the captain of my submarine. And I said, well, I feel like I should know everything about the systems before I stand engineering officer to watch. And we kind of stared each other down for a few minutes. And he said, you know, I qualify you to stand engineering watch. I decide when you're ready to be engineering officer to watch. Do you know what my qualification standard is, what I'm looking for when I sign that bottom line and send you to do it? And I said, well, I assume you want us to know everything possible about the plant, be ready to respond in emergencies. And he said, now it's actually a little bit simpler than that. My qualification standard is three minutes safe. We stared at each other again. That wasn't a term I'd heard before. And he said, do you know what I mean by that? And I said, not really. And he said, I've actually timed it. We could even test it right now. Three minutes is how long it takes the engineering officer, who's much more experienced than me, served a couple tours on a submarine, to wake up from a dead sleep, put on his uniform, and make it back to maneuvering where you're going to be standing watch and take over. That's how long it takes. So you have to be able to keep the train on the tracks for three minutes if the worst possible emergency happens. So that first day, you need to be three minutes safe. And you're not going to go from three to five minutes safe to 15 minutes safe to an hour safe by studying these books. You're going to make that progression by standing watch, by being a leader, by being accountable, by making mistakes and learning and getting better next time. You're not going to learn anymore hiding behind these books. You've got to get in the hot seat. You've got to be the woman in the arena back there and make some choices, lead. And so that was the mentorship I needed in that moment. If it was up to me, I might still be studying those manuals aboard a submarine right now. But he pushed me. He said, go be three minutes safe. And that was terrifying to me as a young leader. But sure enough, I went, and I was three minutes safe. And by the way, I was surrounded by an incredible team. We've talked about teams here. This was my first opportunity to lead a team in real consequential situations where the lives of my fellow sailors were on, on my back. That's a responsibility I took really seriously, but they took it seriously too. I was with sailors who were willing to shape me into a leader that they'd be willing to follow if I was willing to be humble and learn. And so that stories like that are the reason my time on the submarine was the hardest and most developmental experience I've ever had because it shaped me into an operational leader and thinker and teammate. And that's the self that I took to apply to NASA. I would have no business in the astronaut office if I hadn't had that experience. How about right here in the blue pole? So the question is, um, there was a picture I took of the Tri-Cities in the Tri-City Herald. How hard is it to take a picture like that? Really hard. <laughs> um, the, taking a picture of the Tri-Cities was, I had a whole shot list of photos I was hoping to take during my time on the International Space Station. And a photo of my hometown was really high on that list. Um, we're 250 miles above the surface of the Earth, moving at 17,500 miles an hour. So taking a photo of such a small area with our ma maximum zoom lenses, we have lenses that go up to 12,000 times, or 1,200, so 1,200 times magnification. Um, that happens fast. You, we put, you pass over the Tri-Cities in a matter of one to five seconds. So you don't have a lot of time to get that shot. You have to have a really good knowledge of geography. So we're studying satellite imagery ahead of time so that we pick important landmarks. Luckily, the Tri-Cities is along the Columbia River, so I can find it on the coast and follow it all the way up and just machine gun style take pictures of the whole river and hope that one of them is the Tri-Cities. Um, so that's how most of us get these photos of precise locations. Like one of my crewmates while he was up there really wanted to get Mount Everest. Mount Everest is is the tallest mountain, right? You can see it on if you're from the ground. But from up there, it just looks like a mountain, like one peak in a million peaks. Um, so he was doing the same thing, just shh. And then later, we were both on 
satellite imagery zooming in, trying to identify these exact geological fig features to confirm if he had gotten Everest and which one it was before he posted on Instagram and got totally lampooned for posting wrong, the wrong picture. Um, so those photos are tough to get. I didn't have any photography experience beyond taking pictures with my smartphone, really, um, when I got up there. So we, we get some classes and training, but most of us, most of our training is really self-taught once we're up there. It's trial and error, and we have a lot of awesome coaches on the ground, access to those photography instructors, because you don't really know what to ask until you're trying to do it. You want to take a picture of aurora, sunrise, sunset, you know, moon tiny things on the ground like the Tri-Cities. Um, these are all different challenges that you need different skill sets for. So the pictures we took at the beginning were, at least me, were terrible. And as I got further along in the mission, I got a little bit better at it. And you have to have a little bit of luck too, especially for those detailed earth shots. Um, how about back there on the right side, or your left side, I guess. So as we ramp up for the Artemis program, how is training gonna change? Um, yeah, that's an excellent, thing to be thinking about and it's something we're thinking about a lot right now. Um, so we're flying a new capsule on a new rocket. Um, we're going to be building a station around the moon called the Gateway. We're going to have landers, we're going to have habitats, we're going to have rovers, we're going to have robots that we work with on the surface. These are a lot of new systems. We're going to have new suits. Um, so we have to learn all of these new systems, learn how to operate them safely and efficiently as a team. And we have to figure out the best way to train for that. Some of those things we are pretty similar to the training we do already, but some of it's new. It's been a long time since we've trained for a geology mission. A surface, you know, boots on a, another planetary surface trying to pick the best rocks. <laughs> you know, like that's, I I'm don't have a background in geology, so I'm going to take that responsibility really seriously. Um, but a big part of our training will be geology training, so that when we go out on those spacewalks, we know what we're doing, and the geologists on, on the ground aren't, like, just hitting their you know, face palming the whole time, like what are these guys <laughs> doing up there? Um, and hopefully we'll take some geologists with us to the moon, like my friend Jessica Watkins, who's on the space station right now as a planetary geologist. So I'd say she's a prime candidate um, for helping us get that right. But we're adapting all of our training facilities for this new environment. So the, the lunar gravity is one sixth of Earth gravity. So we're used to training for microgravity. This is a different thing altogether. Um, so we have some gravity offload systems that adaptively respond to us in a spacesuit that can kind of simulate how it would feel to walk in these environments and use tools. And we're also adapting that pool so that the scuba divers can learn how to weigh uh, out our suits and provide the experience that we're in microgravity. So we have like an entire sandbox <laughs> in the bottom of that pool now, simulating lunar regolith, and we're starting to practice in our suits and with our tools so that we're ready for those new operational concepts. How about, what, what do you have on your shirt here? What is that? Little green guy. What's your question? So if I ever encountered an alien, what would I do, and what do I think the alien would look like? You know, I think your imagination's really the limit of what intelligent life could look like on another planet who's evolved in a different set of circumstances. So I don't really know. I like to think about it and imagine it. I like to read books that imagine situations like that and watch movies, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure what they would look like. What would I do? That's a different question. Um, I'm not sure. I think that we would uh, try to see what we could learn from each other because they probably know different things than we do. And maybe we could help each other protect our planet, protect our solar system, and work together to make life on Earth better and maybe life on their planet better. We're going to go to your sister now, okay? Why do we have to wear spacesuits in outer space? We have to wear spacesuits in outer space because space is something that we like to call a vacuum. Not like your vacuum cleaner that you use at home, but a vacuum means that there's no air. So right now we're able to breathe because the atmosphere of the Earth holds the air onto our planet. And so we're breathing in that air and able to stay alive because of that. When we're out in the vacuum of space, there's no air and it's e really cold, either really cold or really hot, depending on if we're in the shadow or in the sun. And so we have to be able to stay alive in that environment. So all the things that are just happening natur naturally for us on Earth that we've evolved to live in, aren't out there in outer space. So the spacesuit helps us create a contained environment. It's like our own personal atmosphere that gives us air to breathe and keeps us at the right temperature, water to drink, so that we can go stay alive while we're out there working. It's like a miniature spaceship. How do we use the bathroom in space and why do we stand up when we sleep? Um, that's an excellent one. Going to the bathroom in space is tough. You kind of have to re-potty train yourself. And we actually have potty training at NASA to prepare us for this before we launch. Um, 
But the toilets are a little bit different up there because you saw how liquids uh, behave in space, and we talked about that a little bit earlier. If you tried to go to the bathroom the same way you do on Earth, you'd make a real mess, <laughs> and nobody would want to clean it up. So we have these special toilets. So if we need to go pee, number one, urinate, we have this special hose that's kind of like a vacuum you would use at home. <laughs> it provides suction, so there's a special fan that pulls air and liquid away from our bodies. And then there's a funnel at the end. So it's kind of like peeing in a cup at the doctor's office, but you pee into this funnel and it sucks it away from your body. And we actually need to reuse that urine because getting stuff to space is hard. We watched how much firepower it took to get a little capsule to space. People drink a lot of water. Our equipment needs water to be cooled up there. So we actually have to recycle the water that we drink and that comes out of our bodies in sweat. So the sweat gets de dehumidified in our air conditioning system and put back into the drinking water system. And the urine gets reprocessed into drinking water. So my crewmate, Mark Vanda, I like to say that today's co coffee is tomorrow's coffee. <laughs> and he's not wrong. Um, so that's number one. Number two is similar. We also use suction force. Um, there's a kind of a miniature toilet, a little canister with a bag in it. Um, and you position your body over it and go poop. And the suction pulls the poop away from your body into the bottom of the bag. You wipe very carefully. Um, and then, actually, we usually wear nitrile gloves for this because you can't really wash your hands normally in space either. So you wear gloves just in case you get anything on your hands. Um, and then you throw it all away, and we pack it as tight as we can because consumables are limited into these special canisters. And then eventually they get thrown away with the trash. Was that your whole question? <laughs> oh, sleeping, standing up. Um, so. Nobody really stands up in space. We kind of pick one direction for us all to normally orient our bodies. The computers are all that way. The labels are all that way. And that's because the human brain really likes to pretend it's on Earth even if it's not. People feel a little more comfortable like that. But really, we use all of the space on the space station, every single surface in every direction we use for equipment and to work. So we're kind of just floating around, and you can stand in any direction you want. Um, and so when we're sleeping, we're not really laying down either. We're just kind of floating there. Have any of you guys ever been in the deep end of the pool and kind of let, you hold your breath, but you let a little bit out so you can just float without sinking or floating back to the top? Have you guys ever done that? Yeah, it kind of feels like that, except you don't have to hold your breath. And so it feels like that when you relax, that you're just kind of hanging there. And so we have sleeping bags that we tie up to the wall in our little rooms. Um, some people like to be really tight to the wall and put bungee cords over themselves so they feel more like they're in bed. I toss and turn a lot when I sleep, so I don't like feeling that restricted because it actually wakes me up if I try to move and I can't. So I hung my sleeping bag really loosely so I could move around, but my sleeping bag kept me contained so I didn't like bounce off the wall and wake up or go too far. What did it feel like in space? You mean to float around like that? Yeah, it's a really weird experience, and it takes a little bit of time to get used to. This is the one thing that's really hard to train. Um, the closest experience we get is we have these special planes that fly. It's called parabolic flight, but they fly in this big shape that's like the shape of a wave. And when they hit the top and start coming down, it feels like we're in microgravity for 18 seconds at a time. So we get 18 seconds to practice flying and floating around. Usually it's just pretty much fun. You don't really get that used to it. Um, but when we get up there, we have to get used to moving around this new way. And one thing that's really cool is our bodies feel weightless, so it feels like you can fly. And you don't need that much force to get moving pretty quickly. And so when we start moving around, as you get a little, at the beginning you're really tentative and awkward and bounce off walls all the time. But as you get a little bit of confidence, you start to fly faster and faster. But then you learn an important lesson. It's easy to go fast, it's hard to stop. So you crash into walls, run into your friends, run into computers and all this stuff. So you have to learn how to have a little bit more control, more finesse. So it's a little bit of an art form. And so we learn how to move around a lot better after a couple of weeks. Are there any computers on the ships? Yes, we have tons of computers up there um, and tablets that we use. And that's because it's the best way for us to communicate with the ground a lot of information at a time. But we also use what is basically a space walkie-talkie. So we're calling down to the ground on a radio signal. And so usually we're just communicating by voice with the crew on the ground. How about right here in the front? 
question is, what do we do in a medical emergency? Um, so we do have some physician astronauts, but it's not a requirement for a crew. We were lucky, Tom Marshburn is an ER physician. So we had the best of the best there with us and felt very secure knowing that if anything went wrong, he was gonna run the show. Um, but we all get basic medical training and we have a special certification called crew medical officer. And for some reason, they trained our entire crew as crew medical officers. So we got more advanced training than, than most crews have. Um, we learn basic trauma care, CPR, um, how to administer medicines. Dental work is actually a thing that we've actually done on space, because imagine having a really bad toothache, you need a root canal, we can't do it up there. So we learn how to pull each other's teeth. Um, and so that's actually happened in space, because otherwise you'd have to come home. Some people have had so much pain that otherwise they'd have to be sent home for that care. So you just pull a tooth, deal with it later, um, stuff like that. So we actually all get trained for basic medical care and first aid, emergency response, and stuff like that. And then there are always physicians on the ground who specialize in responding to all sorts of emergencies in this special space flight environment. So they're immediately available to us on a private communication loop to help guide us through that process if something were to go wrong. But luckily we've never had um, on the space station any major medical emergencies, just minor stuff like, you know, hit your head and you get a little gash or something like that. Um, that's pretty easy to treat. Um, how about in the gray shirt, almost in the back there? So how do we wash our hair, or wash our body in space? Actually, so I, ha I have a video posted on YouTube and Instagram of me washing my hair in space. So if you look up my Instagram, you can actually see a video, which is pretty cool. Um, but it's kind of like a camp shower. We don't, water wouldn't fall like it would down here in the shower. So we use those same bags of water you saw earlier and these special towels that are impregnated with soap and we can put water into them to just kind of towel our bodies off with uh, soap and hot water. Um, and then to wash your hair, you use the same bag we use to drink water from and the straw. I just kind of guide it through my hair to get it wet, put soap in, suds it up, and then it takes a while to rinse it if you really want to wash your hair. So some people don't wash their hair. You definitely don't wash your hair every day. I think I wash my hair every four or five days and in between I just kind of got it wet and hoped it would <laughs> be all right because it, it probably took me um, 15 minutes to wash my hair if I really wanted to give it a good clean. So I waited for a day where I wasn't as busy or did it on the weekend. How about right here? Have they ever, so Raja and Tom, the question was did they ever mess up my haircut? They didn't end up cutting my hair because we didn't think we needed it, but they were trained just in case because that's the way our crew approaches all problems. Be ready. How about right here? Oh, that's really interesting. I'm looking at my parents because they might have ideas. I don't know. My mom looks like she maybe has an idea. I don't know. I've been asked to almost everything, and especially this week. I, like, crossed the Rubicon this week. I had a couple of kids at the high school ask me about having your period in space, which we talk about at work. We talk about, we talk about pooping and peeing, like we've already talked about tonight. So we talk about all these things because you have to plan a little bit differently for time and space. And so that was the first time I got asked this question. I'm like, Man, these Gen Z has something going on where they're like, I don't think I would have asked that question as a millennial, but I'm definitely comfortable talking about it. So, um, yeah, I don't. I think there's nothing I haven't heard at this point. Like I said <laughs> earlier, how about right there? Yeah. So the question is, do I have a different perspective about the connectedness of our planet, seeing it as one whole planet rather than, you know, H Houston is my current home. I'm from Tri Cities or from the United States. Um, absolutely. The, this sounds kind of nerdy and also kind of obvious at the same time, but the first thought that popped into my head when I looked out the window and saw the Earth from that perspective for the first time is the Earth is a biosphere. And it is, we all know that. But seeing it in that way, all of a sudden, it just really drove home this visceral sense that it is one giant connected organism. And it doesn't look like you learn in class where you see the maps on the wall with the different states colored different or countries colored different to show borders and outlines. It is one shared planet. It's amazing that it exists at all. It's amazing that any of us exist here. It's amazing that I exist here and got to see it from that perspective in space. And so for me, yeah, it definitely drove home the power of our connectedness and I think the power of what we can do when we work together, which I think we need a little bit more of in our world right now. Um, and the beautiful thing about the International Space Station is the international part, I think, is the most important thing. We wouldn't have that facility if we didn't work together with our international partners. 
and the opportunity to facilitate that kind of cooperation is the foundation of our relationships with some of these countries. Um, so for me, the space station is a place of peace and cooperation and working together towards a common good that we all share. And so yes, absolutely, I definitely had that feeling that we're all connected, we all need to work together to accomplish great things. How about right here? So the question is, when we're in our rocket, how do we know which direction is which, which way is up, which way we're going, um, if space is just continuous and it's hard to tell where you are? Well, we have special navigation systems that tell us where we're oriented in relation to key landmarks. So there's things like celestial navigation, these sensors that look out at the stars. And if you find multiple known points, three is a good number to think about there, and draw lines, they'll connect to where you are. So you can use things like that to determine where you are. And then we have these special sensors that monitor between points in the, those fixes, essentially, telling us where we are. They tell us how the capsule has moved between those times. And so we're able to kind of guess where we should be with a high level of accuracy. Um, so we're able to tell exactly where we are. Can I take one more, Jim? He's telling me it's time. OK, <laughs> that's nice. And I know it's. I know it's 8.30, we'll get one more question. How about the kid in the back there? What's my favorite leadership characteristic? I would say humility. And I think those of us, especially in the military as young leaders, we have to learn how to balance confidence and humility. Because if you want to lead a team, you have to believe in yourself and your decisions. You have to be able to communicate confidently to get that team behind you. But when you're new, like my story from the submarine earlier, you don't know everything. And you need to be able to learn and grow. And if you don't have the humility to admit when you've made a mistake, how is that process ever going to play out? And how are you going to earn the respect and trust of your team? And so for me, humility is the most important thing when it comes to leadership, that you're willing to admit when you made a mistake and try again better next time. That's how I built trust with the people around me. That's what I expect of my teammates as well. Um, so yeah, that would, I think, be the single most important characteristic. We have some people who think it's bedtime in here. I can definitely tell. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. It means so much to me to have the chance to share my experiences with you. Thanks for your great questions.